Effective sales team management can be challenging, filled with opportunities for missteps and a minefield for businesses, especially those who are trying to scale. What do business owners and C-suite decision makers need to know about this critical driver of revenue? In a moment, we'll find out. Stay tuned. This is Business Confidential Now with Hannah hassel Kelchner, helping you see business issues hiding in plain view that matter to your bottom line. Welcome to Business Confidential Now, the weekly podcast for smart executives, managers, and entrepreneurs looking to improve business performance and their bottom line. I'm your host, Hannah hassel Kelchner, and today I'm excited to welcome Rex Neckley back to the show. Rex is the founder of First Avenue Advisors, an industry agnostic professional service firm based on process discipline and the belief that ordinary people can accomplish extraordinary outcomes when they know how, why, and what to focus on. He enables middle market and lower market businesses to increase organic revenue and retention. Actually, the last time he joined us, we talked about how to be a rock star of sustainable business growth. And now it's one thing to be the rock star and quite another to build a successful team of rock stars. So he's actually built several successful sales teams, turned around struggling organizations and led multiple cultural changes. He's averaged 22.3% annual organic growth over 25 years of sales and marketing leadership. So I'm very interested in his experience and perspective on effective sales team management. Welcome to Business Confidential Now, Rex. Well, thank you, Hannah. This is exciting for me. It's certainly one of my favorite topics, and you're one of my favorite people to talk with. So I think we're going to have a good few minutes together. I think so. I know so. Let's put it that way. Or you wouldn't be here, Rex. (laughs) Let's put it that way. (laughs) I'll be off selling something. That's right. That's right. Lots of times there's a star salesperson and they get promoted into a VP position because, well, they're so good at selling. But leading a team of sales professionals is a different animal. And in your experience, I'm curious about what makes someone effective at sales team management. I mean, besides steadily increasing the bottom line, those are the results we're looking for, of course. But what kind of characteristics does somebody need to bring to that role besides being a stellar salesperson? Yeah, great question. And one that's not answered all that effectively in the real world from my experience. I think you're right. A lot of people will look within their organization and say, gosh, that guy or that girl is a great seller. Customers love her or him. And the numbers are great. And we need a sales manager or a sales leader or a sales VP. Let's promote them. And just about everybody knows that that's done and it's not really the most effective. So what I have done in the past is kind of figure out some things that have worked for me, and I'm assuming that they would work for most people to give it a try, and we'll talk about those today. So if you ask me the question, what makes someone effective at sales team management, the first question I ask myself and then ask them is, can you teach it, and do you want to teach it? And you'd be surprised about how many people that are up for promotion and love the ego trip aren't really interested in teaching it because, quite frankly, they don't understand everything about their success. And many of them don't want to teach it because they really like what they do and they don't want to let anybody else down so they don't know how to get out of it. Interesting. So is that the biggest challenge you find that a newly minted sales leader faces in being able to let go and make that transition into leadership? Is there more to it? Oh, there's much more, and it depends on the individual on which one is best or a biggest, I should say, but they're all, we'll call them failure points and things that can certainly be corrected. One of the biggest, and this is pervasive, is do, does the organization and then the individual taking on the role, do they understand that they have a sales team or do they have a sales force? And you may think that they're fungible terms. You may think that they're synonymous. Let me tell you my perspective. A sales team shares a common goal. They're team members. They help each other. They have complementary strengths. Sometimes you hire based on other people's weaknesses, and they often get rewarded collectively, and that's a sales team. And quite often, it's bigger than just salespeople. It also includes customer service or tech service and that kind of thing. But you have a sales team that work interdependently, and you lead for interdependence. And Contrast that with a sales force, a group of individual contributors. 
they're rewarded on their own performance, and all selling behavior is independent. So you can think about car dealerships, you can think about software companies, even very, very, very large software companies. And as a leader or a manager here, you want to manage the eventualities to enable individual success, not necessarily team success. And you spend more time than you would normally, certainly in a team scenario, you spend more time protecting the organization because the people, the individuals, the sellers that you have on a sales force, and again, they're individual contributors and they get rewarded on their own performance, they're more interested in their performance and their success than they are. I'm not saying they would do anything nefarious toward their company, but they're not as interested in protecting their company. That really is left up to someone else. So to me, those are two big scenarios that people may or may not be aware of. And quite frankly, they try to mush the two together. And it's like anything else, you're going to get the worst of all worlds as opposed to the best of all worlds if you're not clear on this, either as senior management or as the individual that's taken on the role. That's an important fork in the road. And I'm glad that you raised that. So in which category would like independent reps fall into? Independent reps would be on a sales force. So again, that would be car dealerships. Actually, I know a car dealer that changed from that and they're being, they're quite successful. They have a sales team now, not a sales force, but most car dealerships, most, again, software companies, large computer companies, anytime that the infrastructure is set up in such a way that they just need to move product or move service, then they want to go hire highly skilled salespeople that are not interdependent. They are independent. They're fungible. They come and go. You're hiring skill. And if they stick with you for a while, great. If they come and go, you might have to expect that. On a sales team, it's more nurturing. And again, it's more interdependent. And you find sales teams stick together longer with each other and stay with the organization longer. So is one really better than another? No. What is required is to understand which system you need for your business and for your organization. What is tragic is when you mismatch. So if you have, say, for instance, a company or a, a service that would lend itself to a sales force, which would be independent hired guns, as it were, and you try to make a team of interdependent individuals, you're not going to be as successful as you could be. And quite frankly, your competitors probably are not going to make that mistake, and then you're going to be outperformed in the field. The reverse is true. And this is what I see the most is there'll be sales teams out there. They should be managed, led, and compensated interdependently. And they try to mix that by saying, okay, we're going to pay our salespeople on their own performance, but we're going to expect them to act as a team. And to some extent, you see that transition in college sports to professional sports. So in college sports, you see people acting as a team because they're up until recently, they're not even compensated. So they're acting as a team. They're interdependent. And you get into the realm of professional sports and some often you'll see free agents and all kinds of things going on that indicate to you that these are individual contributors that happen to play on the same organization with the same team colors. That's a great comparison. I think that helps make it crystal clear. Now, in your consulting practice, when you're asked to come in and evaluate a sales organization, regardless of which bucket it falls in, is that what you find to be the biggest issue up front, is that they're mixing and matching between these two sort of culturally incompatible types of forms between a sales force versus a sales team? Yes, that's exactly right. And it happens honestly, for lack of a better term, because people that help make these decisions on how to have an organizational structure or who to hire, quite frankly, there's typically senior leadership and sometimes they're private equity owners or they're a group of folks that own a company that may or may not have been in the field and understand these things. So they're actually making these mistakes and guiding inaccurately with the best of intentions. But that's exactly what I see. I see people, as a matter of fact, I've heard the very pejorative term, listen, all salespeople are coin operated. Whoa. Quote unquote. And it's very pejorative. But what it tells you is that person's background is we want hired guns that understand how to sell. They take a product, whether it's a widget, a gallon, a pound of service, and they go out and they make magic happen and sell that thing. But they aren't really part of a team. That's what the person that would say that term, that's what they're used to they're not necessarily ever been exposed to or at least understood what a sales 
team, an interdependent sales team is about. It also sounds to me like they're strictly numbers oriented. So if it doesn't translate immediately to the bottom line, all the magic that happens doesn't really register with them as drivers of that bottom line. That's correct. And again, that happens in business today because things are on shorter terms. If somebody buys a company, their selling window is three to five years. Back in the day, certainly 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, you're going to be with the company for a long time and you had time to develop interdependence, teams, and really quite sophisticated operations for your customers. So whether you have a team or a sales force really influences tremendously who you're going to hire. How does it impact the training and coaching? Yeah, great question. So getting back to the sales manager or sales leader, there's more things that they must understand. So somebody that's going to be, let's just say, accountable and in charge of, for lack of a better term, Mm -hmm. the selling effort, they really need to understand the difference between management and leadership. So management, in my humble opinion, is response or reaction to outside events or inputs. And leadership is thoughtful proactivity based on a vision. So you can literally have management and leadership in either one of the scenarios I spoke of earlier, a sales team or a sales force. But you have to be clear on what kind of organization you have and then be clear on some things like the difference between management and leadership. The other thing that's, well, there's several things really, The critical success factors of anyone that's in a leadership role or a management role are not that dissimilar to any other profession. Awareness, knowledge, skill, execution, and continuous improvement. If your sales manager, sales leader has awareness of what is going on, I mean, as basic as do I have a sales team scenario or do I have a sales force scenario, knowledge on what to do the skill in which to do it, the ability to execute, and then, of course, a continuous improvement for himself and others, whether that's uh, taking courses, reading books, peer review, spending time with other people in your same scenario, and learning from them. Those are the critical success factors. And a lot of people kind of get lost in the sauce because the daily grind of what they must do now, they've got this job, vice president or national sales manager or global sales manager, And they've got a lot of pressure for results. And sometimes they forget in kind of a tongue-in-cheek, I say, you know, you could never be too busy driving to stop and get gas. And gas here is the understanding, the awareness, the knowledge, the execution, and certainly the continuous improvement. The other thing that I guess one of the challenges of a newly minted leader or manager is do they know who they are? And what I mean by that is do they have a brand and do they understand it? Now, in my case, when I've taken over teams, and again, this isn't about me, but I can tell you what's worked for me, is I was clear on who I was, and I was going to project that, and it was going to be my brand with the audiences that I have in my new role or even in in my consulting role. So my brand is authentic. It's transparent. It's consistent. It's no surprises, which means I tell bad news just as fast as I would tell good news, and I'm highly available. And this is going back 20, 30 years. So this has been consistent for me. I know this about myself. I want to project it. And when I say it's my brand, you know, the definition of brand that I use, it's the space owned in the mind of the customer or the receiver. So I want people to know that I'm authentic, transparent, consistent, no surprises, and highly available. And the reason I kind of harp on this is a lot of times people will get a new role and they kind of forget who they are. They try to mold themselves into what they think other people want them to be, or somehow or another, they get a drift of what's worked for them before. And my strong advice is go look in the mirror, talk to your spouse, talk to some friends and say, let's, I want to make sure that I know who I am and what got me here because I need this to help get me to the next level. That's important, I think, for any kind of role, because sometimes you just don't appreciate how others see you. And what you may think is a weakness, they actually think is a strength and vice versa. So it's always good to have those reality checks. I wholeheartedly endorse that. Right. One of the other things that I was going to mention while we're kind of under this large umbrella of transition from seller to sales leader, sales manager, is another failure point. Another thing that people kind of forget is now they have different audiences. What do I mean by that? So when they were a seller, they had essentially two audiences. 
They had their boss, of course, and then they had the customer. And they knew how to work with those audiences quite well, got them successful. As a matter of fact, this is why they're up for promotion. And this is why they're now being asked to take on a different role. So with a different role comes audiences that they want to recognize and understand. Now they have senior management as an audience. And senior management wants results. Now they have the sales professionals that they lead is their audience. So now they're no longer their peers. Now they're folks that report to them and folks that are depending on them. So that's their audience. And then, of course, they have customers that are their audience. And the outcomes that they're looking for really just have their expectations managed. And most of the time, their expectations can be summed up in they want things in specification, on time, and at a fair price. So again, one of the failure points, and sometimes it takes just a little while and sometimes it takes a longer while for people to realize that their audiences have changed and now their senior management, the sales professionals that report to them, and the customers, of course, that depend on them. Well, that's the perfect segue, Rex. You may not realize that, but when you talk about the different audiences and especially senior manager or senior management, rather, or the business owner now being more of a direct line having to them, my question is, what can those business owners or senior management do to help make their sales manager more successful? That's a great question. And I certainly wish it was gotten asked more often in boardrooms across the country. The first thing is would be to listen. And I know that sounds obvious, but many times the questions asked in the boardroom to the sales manager is, tell me about the numbers, tell me about the numbers, tell me about the numbers. And those are important. Don't get me wrong. They're very, very important conversations. But also, and it's happening more, but not as much. The next question is, what can we do to help? Typically, the answer to that from the sales leader, the sales manager is resources, enablement. And when I say enablement, I mean perhaps a sales analyst. And I'm seeing more and more of this now where sales analysis used to be taking up a huge amount of time for the sales vice president or the sales manager or the global salesperson. Now they're actually hiring an individual to most likely sit in an office and crunch the numbers and answer the questions both for senior management and of course for sales team or the sales force so they can make better decisions and audible calls while they're out in the field. Is there anything else that senior management can do to help their teams be more successful? I think just understand and support whatever the sales leader has decided the organization is, whether it's a sales team and the team members are going to be interdependent or it's a sales force and they are going to be independent and sales force employees are going to come and go more rapidly. So I guess the understanding that when somebody leaves the company, it's not that something bad is happening in the company. If salespeople leave the company and they're on a sales team, that probably takes a little bit more analysis to understand why than if a hired gun that's quite frankly and quite appropriately out for themselves, they may jump ship for somebody that has a higher commission rate. They may jump ship for somebody that has a better scenario for them and the earning power that they have. So I think just listening and understanding that all sales forces and sales teams are not created equal. Fair enough. We've covered a lot. And I particularly like drawing this distinction and giving us a better understanding between a sales force and a sales team and how they really speak different languages when it comes to expectations and the management and the leadership necessary in order to get the performance that maybe an organization is looking for. In the few minutes that we have left, is there anything else you'd like the audience to know, especially maybe smaller businesses that don't have those deep resources to hire an analyst about what they can do to be more effective in managing their sales team or a sales force? Yeah. So one of the things that I guess I want to kind of bring to the front is a good salesperson is who I would hire or promote to be a great sales manager. And so I'm choosing my words carefully because great salespeople, and when I say great salespeople, I mean people that have great numbers, make a lot of money for themselves, make a lot of money for their company. Great salespeople are often highly self-oriented. And that's not a bad thing. It just is a fact. 
So they are less other oriented. Good salespeople tend to be a little bit more of a balance and other oriented and maybe a little bit less self oriented. So they actually have what it takes, in my perspective, to be great sales managers. And the three things that really I look for is genuine curiosity, very well or very highly organized, and enjoy helping people get what they need. So those three things, if I'm promoting someone or hiring someone, I will look at what made them a good salesperson. And without doubt, it's going to be that they're genuinely curious, that they're very well organized, and they enjoy helping help others get what they want. Now that they've got senior leaders depending on them for sales numbers, now that they've got salespeople depending on them for leadership and knowledge and help to carry them through on their careers, and now that they've got a larger stable of customers that are requiring and demanding from them even more, the genuine curiosity, being very well organized, and enjoying others get what they need is critical and will help them be great sales managers. Excellent. So we've got a blueprint for what to do and how to figure out where we are in the grand scheme of things. Thank you so much, Rex. I appreciate you and the important work you do in helping organizations be more prosperous by building, developing more effective sales teams or sales forces, as I've now learned. And if you're listening and you'd like more information about Rex Neckley, the First Avenue Advisors, that information as well as a transcript of this interview can be found in the show notes at businessconfidentialradio.com. Thanks so much for listening. Be sure to tell your friends about the show and leave a positive review. We'll be back next Thursday with another episode of Business Confidential Now. So until then, have a great day and an even better tomorrow.